Hello there, this is Dr. Mintz. This is a patient who has had a medical history of an arteriovenous malformation, an AVM in the brain, and here we're going to review some of the findings of that. So here is an overview of the head CT with some obvious findings, but the, char the characterization of the findings may not be altogether simple, so we'll go through those. Okay, so first of all, clearly we have an abnormality up here in left parietal lobe, I would say. Let's see if we can find the cingulate sulcus. Here's the cingulate sulcus that makes this, you go up and over, and this is the central sulcus. So parietal lobe is behind that, frontal lobe is in front of it. That makes this motor cortex and this sensory cortex. So we have an abnormal area of high attenuation in the left parietal lobe. That is a good starting statement. As we follow this high attenuation area inferiorly, we see that it extends to involve portions of the occipital lobe anteriorly. Remember the occipital lobe and visual cortex are back here, but portions of the occipital lobe are in this area here as well, so they are partially affected. There are areas of calcification like these. These are all calcifications associated with this area of abnormal increased attenuation. And then as we go toward the inferior aspect of this lesion, lesion meaning just an abnormal structure or process, we see something that's different than the calcifications. We see very, very high attenuation material with beam hardening artifact. You don't get this severe a beam hardening artifact from calcifications, in fact, very often you get none, like this. Here we can see the margins of the calcification very well, but metal, which is what this is, has a much higher attenuation and it produces the beam hardening artifact and it's the reason that we cannot see the detail of the metallic particles and chunks that are in here. And you also can't see even the, uh, the margins of the embolic material, and that's what this is. It's embolic material that has been used to embolize this arterial venous malformation. How do I know it's an arterial venous malformation? Well, up here you see somewhat tubular configuration of high attenuation material like this, and like this, and like this, and those are all dilated vessels in this arterial venous malformation. As is not uncommon, we see associated calcifications as well. Now more inferiorly, when we get into these metallic objects, where we have all the beam hardening artifact, that is embolic material, which has been put into the arteries through a catheter in order to diminish the flow to the arterial venous malformation, and therefore to hopefully diminish the likelihood that this will increase or, or at least slow the increase in size of the arterial venous malformation. Now something looks funny down here in the basal cisterns and if we take a look down inferiorly I'll have to ask you what is this? What is this big thick high attenuation tubular structure? Well let's see if we go a little bit farther you have vertebral arteries. I can't make out both of them clearly. I think this is a right vertebral artery and that's left over there. Yes, left and right vertebral arteries. This is the level of the foramen magnum, my favorite Latin term, which means big hole. So when we get to the level of the big hole, foramen magnum, we have right and left vertebral arteries. We follow those up and here you have the right, which is tortuous, not uncommon, and the left which is staying back there. 
and at some point, yeah, here it comes forward, the left. So this is the left vertebral artery, which is very much enlarged. And then at this point, it becomes the basilar artery. And you can see how it's swinging to the left and to the right, in this case, more to the right. And this is because of a high flow state. So very high flow states or hypertension or both can cause enlargement of vessels and tortuosity, but primarily tortuosity in a normal situation. The pressure can cause tortuosity. But to actually dilate the artery such that a vertebral artery can get this big requires a high flow state. And what the arterial venous malformation does is provide a shunting mechanism. That shunting mechanism means that there is less resistance for the arterial flow in the basilar and vertebral arteries to overcome in getting to the venous drainage of the brain. So following this more superiorly, we can see here is the interpeduncular cistern, this V-shape. Uh, this general area here, right here, is the suprasellar cistern. And we have some nice views of the quadrigeminal cistern. Right here, you can see the colliculi. Can't tell if they're superior or inferior colliculi, but that makes this the quadrigeminal plate, and it makes the cistern of fluid, which is the relatively dark area between the brain stem and the cerebellum, cerebrospinal fluid. So cerebrospinal fluid is what we see in cisterns, and this is the quadrigeminal cistern, and this is the interpeduncular system, and these are the cerebral peduncles. The cerebral peduncles carry the pyramidal tracts, the main motor outflow from the brain to the rest of the body, and the cerebral hemispheres kind of rest on these cerebral peduncles, so they are big structures that provide huge pathways for axons to flow upward as sensory information and downward as motor information, motor control. Now remember, this is the basilar artery. The basilar artery is going all the way off to the right. Look, it, it's trying to get into the temporal horn of the right lateral ventricle, and then it says, no, I can't do that, so I'm going to go over this way and it's crossing the midline. It's partly in the interpeduncular system, which is a much longer basilar artery than we would ordinarily see. And then above that, it comes over here. Can't see that real well. But it's supplying, it's part of the supply to this arterial venous malformation. And that arterial, mal that arterial venous malformation has been embolized, and I don't know the degree of success, because the arteries that are enlarged will likely stay enlarged even after the AVM is embolized. It would require an MRI to show the remaining flow in these areas of the AVM, or an arterial venous, or rather, an ar or an arteriogram which would actually show how much flow is in there. And clearly there's flow in here because this is a very large venous structure and it's going down toward the, the straight sinus, probably emptying partly into the straight sinus. And so this is all an arterial venous malformation and it has calcification, as I say, which are common in AVMs. It has high attenuation tubular structures. We can see some of the anatomy so we can identify some structures such as a very tortuous basilar artery here and very prominent draining veins such as this. This would be very dramatic on an arteriogram which would in the late phase show very dense opacification of these big veins. Okay, so that is an arterial venous malformation status post embolization with prominent and tortuous blood vessels which reflect the high flow state 
of the AVM. Okay, and again, this is the supracellar cistern, and if I go down inferiorly, here's the cella turcica, and that's as nice as you're going to see it on a CT. You have this low attenuation area here, which is fluid attenuation, as you see it's similar to the to the fourth ventricle and to the middle cerebral artery cisterns. So this is fluid. On each side is a cavernous sinus, a venous structure, which among other things drains venous drainage from the orbits. And then down deeper in this would be the pituitary gland itself. So this is probably a little bit of pituitary here, the darker area probably averaging with some of the fluid. This may be the pituitary infundibulum, that little tiny dot there, if you can see that. And on both sides are these rather thick areas on, on the left and right, which are the cavernous sinuses through which course the internal carotid arteries on both sides. Now, I think that the, the internal carotid artery on the left here has a little calcification. This may be bony structure, but I think this is a calcification in the internal carotid artery. It doesn't look like it's just averaging, but it might be. So you have the cella turcica with the cavernous sinuses on both sides, with internal carotid arteries coursing through the cavernous sinuses, and those are called the cavernous segments of the internal carotid arteries, or just cavernous internal carotid arteries. And this is all part of the structure of the sphenoid bone, primarily the sphenoid bone. And the sphenoid bone goes off here, and it goes off like this. So it contributes to the structure of the orbits as well. OK, and if we can see again, here is the cingulate sulcus. The one on the left is obscured by mass effect, but the cingulate sulcus is your guide to the lobes of the brain because if you go forward and to the side, you will see a sulcus that is the central sulcus. So this is central sulcus here, and it's probably this on the left side, but it's compressed by mass effect. And being able to make that distinction and to identify this cingulate sulcus as distinct from all these other bumps and, and uh, chasms uh, is an important part to identifying where the motor cortex is on both sides and where the sensory cortex is on both sides and thereby properly describe what lobes are affected by various pathologies. And as we go down here, here is the tentorial incisura. So remember the tent, if this is the head you're looking at from the side here, we'll turn it so it's facing you. The tentorium is like this, and it separates the cerebellum, separates the cerebellum below from the cerebral hemispheres above. And it has this little opening through which the brain stem passes from the posterior fossa superiorly into the supratentorial cranial vault. So this is the tentorial incisura here, where it gets really quite narrow. And this is the free margin of the tentorium. The tentorium is a reflection of dura, so it's thin but tough and leather-like. And it separates the posterior fossa from the remainder of the calvarial vault. And as we go down, because of this shape of the tentorium, as you go down, instead of catching this little V, you catch something more like this little V, because you're, you're down lower in it. And then, as you go down, this separation of the tentorium, this separation provided by the tentorium, divides the supertentorial space from the posterior fossa. And this little area here is, this structure rather, this structure is the cerebellum poking up through, or at least to, the level of the tentorial incisura. 
And here you have all cerebellum. This is all cerebellar structure here and here. This is all cerebellar. And the tentorium is still here. So that dural layer that separates cerebellum from cerebrum is visible sometimes just as something that you don't see very well, but it's, it's visible as a separation between the cerebellum and the cerebrum, the cerebellum over here and the cerebrum. And you can kind of tell that there is something right here. Some of it is vascular that's actually providing the increased density but the tentorium itself is not well seen, but we know it is here. And it attaches to this part of the temporal bone, the petrous portion of the temporal bone. So if you go up from that, you find the tentorium. 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 Cerebellum. Cerebrum. Cerebellum here and cerebrum, probably occipital lobe of the cerebrum. And maybe we can go up a little bit higher. Aha! And here's the tentorial incisura, which is sometimes used to describe just the angle where the two sheets meet. There's an important vein that drains from there, also the straight sinus, which goes into the confluence of sinuses. Okay, that's enough for now.